Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Susan Pincus, and I am a National Careers Professional with the College of Law. And I'm very excited to welcome you all here to the webinar that I'm running with um, Andrea Phillips. And I'll introduce Andrea to you in a minute. The topic for today's webinar is how to bounce forward after a knockback. And I think that particularly in this time during COVID, this is particularly apt and, and important that we, we talk about this. So I'm very excited to have Andrea with me. Andrea is an adjunct lecturer in law at the College of Law in Victoria. She's also a qualified psychologist. She's also worked as a lawyer. She's a mindfulness tutor at Monash University amongst lots of other things. Um, and she will tell you a little bit more about herself in a minute. So just very briefly, my role as a National Careers Professional is to work with PLT students and also with alumni and to help them kind of navigate and set them up for um, entering the workforce as a professional and just giving them a, as much advice and support as possible. So I do this through one-on-one -on -one coaching sessions at the college and also through running a number of webinars. Um, housekeeping, just a few matters here, is just to say that um, if you have any questions, I'd really love you to write those questions into the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. Rather than doing it through chat, it's just much easier for us to look at those questions and we'll allow um, a good 15 minutes question time at the end of the session. And you'll also be sent a recording of this as well and a very quick feedback survey on the, on the webinar. So I look, I'm very excited to introduce you to Andrea before we get started. Hi everybody. I think it's a really timely topic. It's something that I'm hearing a lot of um, about from the students that I'm working with at the College of Law, but also in my other um, roles as well. So I've been, um, as Susan said, lucky enough to have um, a degree in law and also a degree in psychology and be able to use both of those. So I have worked as a lawyer. I did my articles in Melbourne and then I worked in civil litigation in London for a number of years. Uh, and then I um, worked in commercial law in Brussels. So again, a different type of law, a codified system of law, which was really interesting to see how you can, you know, turn law on its head and, and learn it in a different way. Um, I also now work um, at Monash in, in um, a variety of roles, more to do with psychology and in particular to do with well-being which is something that's been really um, interesting to be involved in this year. So I work with the, um, the medical students, the pharmacy students and the engineering master's students. And we go through a program of um, thinking about well-being and how to, to best live your life. Um, so um, I, I'm happy to get started with, um, with right. these whenever we need to do so, Susan. All right, okay, so let's see if I can share the screen. Just make sure that you can all see that. Yep, you can see that. Mm -hmm. All right, so let's start. So we'll go on to what we're going to cover in today's session. So we're gonna really just open up with some common observations from uh, my meetings that I have with students. And also Andrea, yeah, you feel, please feel free to, to add in any time. We're gonna talk about, yeah, how to reframe your mindset, how to shift your energy to what you can create. Uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about your points of difference and also some steps that you can start taking now. So let's move on. So I find that I'm meeting with students constantly and also with alumni as well. And when I'm speaking to students, I often find that they, they start with a comment like, there's something I must be doing wrong or I keep on getting rejected, I've applied, applied for jobs, I don't even hear back sometimes. Um, I, don't, you know, I don't seem to have the right experience, I've got 
just not enough experience in law. My grades are really ordinary. So I suppose that means I'm not going to be able to get many jobs. Also, I can't seem to, to get anywhere. So I'm just, it must be my age. So it's interesting how these seem to become people's stories and that becomes kind of their, their reality and what they think is the truth. And it does feel very personal, a lot of this. So um, I suppose it's trying to just um, unravel this a little bit today in this session and just to say that, you know, this is a very, very common theme that I'm hearing all the time and how to refocus and how to um, really, I suppose, change your mindset into to thinking differently. Yes, I would really echo what Susan has said. All those comments are things that I hear from students as well. And so what we thought we would start with is this research about um, your mindset. It is all about your mindset. There's some fantastic research that's been done by Carol Tweck about these two different types of mindsets that people have. So some people have a growth mindset and some people have a, a, a fixed mindset. And we'll come back and look at those comments from the students and see where these things might fit in in a minute. So when we're thinking um, about an individual who has a growth mindset, they generally believe that their abilities, their talents and their intelligence can be developed over time. And that, you know, obstacles are seen as giving rise to challenges and opportunities for you. And that with effort, learning and persistence, you can get better, smarter and more talented. If you contrast that with the fixed mindset, it's this idea that people believe that their basic abilities, intelligent and talents are fixed and cannot be changed even with effort, okay? So I thought I'd give you some uh, examples of um, the fixed mindset. So if you're thinking about a fixed mindset, it's, it's limited and it's also limiting. And it's a kind of mental rigidity, rigidity on how we talk to ourselves and how we talk to others. So when you're thinking about this in relation to jobs, I want you to be thinking about how you could be um, categorizing your mindset. So things like when you're confronted with a challenge, um, do you say things like this? Uh, I can't do that. Or um, I don't have enough talent for that. Or it's, safe, it's safer not to try. Or what will people think of me when I fail? And this is part of the fixed mindset that failure is essentially seen as confirmation of what you already know about yourself. So if you're thinking about some of the common themes that Susan mentioned in the previous slide, this idea of I don't have enough experience mm -hmm. is one of those fixed mindset comments. So we're wanting to show you how you can change your mindset to say, I don't have enough experience yet. So we're looking at the next slide, which is about your growth mindset. So if we're going through that, it's all about this idea that um, abilities can improve through practice or effort. And failure is a chance to learn. And Feedback is a chance to improve and develop. And I'll stop on feedback because feedback is really important. So if we're looking at those comments that Susan mentioned she gets all the time, I keep getting rejected when applying for jobs. I don't even hear back from companies. Ask them for feedback. Write to them and ask them for feedback. Try and get some feedback so you've got a chance to improve and develop new systems. That's your growth mindset. It's this idea of looking at things um, and embracing the challenge and finding ways to work hard to improve yourself so that you're not saying, um, I don't have enough experience. 
Um, the idea, of course, too, that it's this journey. It's a lifelong journey. Growth mindset is a lifelong journey. We are constantly trying to improve ourselves and keep learning and finding um, new ways of um, bettering ourselves as a person, but also in our work capacity. And also this idea that you can be creative in the, in the ways that you think about um, applying for jobs and getting experience and those sorts of things. We can quickly run through the fixed mindset. So this idea that your abilities are innate and unchangeable. Uh, if you think about that in relation to um, a job application, that's not going to make you come across as somebody that is keen to um, adapt to a new culture and learn new systems. Again, this idea that um, failure is permanent. So um, we'll talk a bit more about that later on. It's not. It's something that's temporary. It's something that's happening to you at the moment. Again, um, this idea of seeing feedback as a sort of attack. And my thoughts on that would be be aware of constructive feedback, so mm -hmm. things that are helpful for you, but also have the ability to suspend judgment when you think that it's unfair or unhelpful feedback. So it's going to make it make you looking at feedback a bit a bit more of an active process. But ask for feedback. It's really important. It's also the case that, you know, you don't know at the time when you applied for the job, there were no jobs. But when you're asking for the feedback, something might have popped up, something might come out of that. Um, fixed mindset's about choosing easier tasks and putting in minimal effort. I don't think a law firm is wanting you to think like that when you're applying for jobs. Um, don't give up. So. The fixed mindset is fixed mindset is about giving up and not taking those sort of creative approaches to things. So one, if we go on to the next slide, Susan, one of the things you can do to reframe your mindset at the moment. So um, I'm sure that a lot of us, when we were at school, uh, we were put into different streams in relation to maths. And at that point, if you were put into the not so good maths group, that's where you stayed. And you sat in that and you went through and you came out with a fixed mindset was, which was, I'm not very good at maths. Whereas now we're wanting you to think about things in a different way and um, listen to that voice that might be saying that and saying, okay, try and have a growth mindset and say, I'm not good at maths yet. So we want you to be listening to the way you think about things. So when you're trying something new, what's the mindset that you hear yourself saying? When you're attempting to change behaviour, when you're developing a new skill, what's the voice that's talking to you? Listen to that voice. And when you're getting a knockback, when you're getting one of those things where, um, where the, the law firm is saying to you, um, you know, we don't want you, Listen to that voice and see which voice is talking back to you. Is it the one that says, I must be doing something wrong, I keep getting rejected, I don't hear back from companies, those sorts of voices, or is it something where you can turn that around and have a more growth mindset? Remember that you have a choice between the mindsets and talk back to it. Talk back, have a debate with it, be curious about your mindset. Query it. And then thinking about um, taking some action, thinking about my, my maths example or the um, I don't have enough experience example, add the word yet onto the end and see what a difference that makes. I don't have the right experience yet. So if we can learn maths, we can learn to have a growth mindset. We could go into a lot of information on neuros neuroplasticity, which is this big area that has uh, come about in psychology, but it essentially means that you can learn uh, new things. Part of that is being able to think about things creatively, and that's probably on the next slide. The really, really important word in this slide is about shifting your energy to what you can create. It's about being creative. 
at the moment, it's been a really challenging year for everybody. And we know that worrying about the future actually depletes your energy. So I'm going to ask you to try and accept that life is difficult right now and that sometimes things happen that you um, are not able to control. But what you do by accepting that is it allows you the space to think about ways to be more creative going forward. By acceptance, I don't mean giving up. Uh, I want you to think about how you can be more constructive going forward. And this is this idea of re reframing how you view things, seeing it in this growth mindset as a challenge and an opportunity. And in order to do that, we need to be utilising some skills that people have really been working on this year. And one of those is grit. So Susan's going to talk to us about that. Okay. Um, that's just fantastic, Andrea, all that you said. It, it's, so, it's so true. And I was just going to add in a comment there that um, in terms of asking for feedback, I think that's a great idea. Um, and, and sometimes it, it might be harder to, to get the feedback because people are busy. But if you kind of frame it around you're wanting to get feedback for your own professional and personal development, yes. I think kind of that's a good way to frame it as opposed to you're looking um, for the kind of the negative reason to get into a little bit of an argument and, and exactly. um, yeah, make it yeah. more around conflict. So I think that's a great point. Um, so, yeah, we talked about, about the importance of grit or the grit up approach. So what this is about is uh, a, a, a professor and a psychologist, um, Angela Duckworth. She was involved with others in doing a whole lot of studies. And she asked the question, why is it that some individuals actually accomplish more than others? And the interesting thing was that the, the biggest factor that contributes to your success and achievement is not anything to do with your IQ, with your social intelligence, with the way you look, with your physical health at all. It's actually all about this concept of grit. And grit is defined as the passion, the perseverance and the stamina for the long-term goals. So without effort, even the most skilled and talented individuals will not necessarily accomplish. So, you know, this was done on a study um, involving kind of different contexts, with, which included the military academy, national spelling bees, um, new teachers, private companies. So they, they did the study amongst a whole range of different audiences. So being naturally smart and talented is great. But to do truly well and thrive, we need the ability to persevere. So people with grit want to better themselves rather than focus on what they don't have in life. So I think kind of that's a really, really important point as well. And they look at failure. I mean, I don't even like using that word failure, but they look at these as fertile training ground for future improvement. So basically, your grit is totally um, aligned to having a, a growth mindset. So it's, it's a great thing to have, have grittiness. All right. So moving on um, to the next area, which is about resilience. Yeah, I love that um, description of, of grit. And I think everybody would feel that this year that living life is at the moment like a marathon and mm. not a sprint and if you want to bring that analogy to um the knock you know getting knockbacks in relation to applying for positions i think 
that grit is absolutely crucial. It, it's this idea that you keep applying, you keep going, even though you keep getting these knockbacks. And it's the person that does that that will get the job in the end. And another important ingredient that we have been all using this year and that is aligned to that is this idea of resilience. So what is, it, what is resilience? Resilience is, is very akin to grit, except that it is the, it's essentially the bouncing back from these challenging events. And so um, what we want you to consider when you're thinking about knockbacks is how you can hang in there and be resilient and keep working on moving forward. Now, a couple of the areas that you can think about that are helpful for this is the effects of hope and positivity. So what essentially is hope? It's really the belief that your actions can result in a positive future. So by doing the things that you need to, you will end up in a position where you obtain the job that you want. And this can also, having this attitude of hope and positivity, help you feel more in control. And this idea of self-efficacy, of having some sense of control is really important at the moment when we're living in a period when there is so much uncertainty in the world. I'd also like you to think when considering um, resilience that humans are hardwired to have a negativity bias. Now, this stems right back to when, you know, we were hunter-gatherers and you needed to be mindful of negative events and negative events around you in order to survive. So we have evolved to have a negativity bias. So it's very, very common in psychological studies to show that um, if you get five positive comments and one negative comment, what is the one that you focus on? You generally find that people with their negativity bias will focus on the negative comment. And that's, that again comes back to these comments that Susan raised at the beginning. I must be doing something wrong. I keep on getting rejected when applying for jobs. These are the sorts of negative comments that you want to try and weed out. And you want to try and bring in this idea of grit and resilience and hope and positivity and really know a, that the negativity bias exists, but know that setbacks are temporary and that you essentially have the skills and the abilities to combat them. So I want you to think about challenging this assumption about the permanence of the position that you're in at the moment. Andrew, can I, can I just add in something? Yeah. Um, I think it's quite interesting. I was working with a, a student last year and it was just unbelievable. Like he had applied for, I think, a couple of hundred positions. Mm -hmm. And he obviously, he was getting to interview stage, but he wasn't able to, to crack it. And he came along and he saw me and we had a number of sessions together. And it was just so interesting because even though, you know, he'd been knocked back, he always was trying to understand perhaps what was going on and maybe why that was happening. So yeah, I suppose he did come to me with, with a, a bit of a growth mindset and we did some interview practice and we had a really, really kind of great discussion and he went back and he changed his approach and his strategies and he realised that actually in, in the interviews that, you know, perhaps he wasn't putting his best foot forward. And he kept going. He was just incredibly gritty and tenacious. And then the best thing was that I got an email from him and he said, I've actually cracked and landed a job. And the best feedback that I received was around really just changing my, my approach. And for that, I'm ever forever grateful. But, you know, that was an incredible story. And that's going to set him up for for the rest of his, his life and career, knowing that, you know, through the hard 
yards and yakka that you can get through. Yeah, that's right. And yeah. that, and that's essentially the definition of resilience. Mm. This idea that you can get you can experience, you know, more than 200 knockbacks <laughs> and yet still have the capacity mm. to think outside the square, get some assistance, be hopeful, uh, get take the the feedback on board and try and um, establish a different approach which led to successful mm. results. Mm. Yeah, it's really Absolutely. a great story. I really the, hope everybody hears that and doesn't become despondent. Um, no, no. <laughs> so that's like that definition of insanity is doing the same thing every time and expecting a different result. Yeah. yeah. I think that was Einstein. Yeah, that's yes, one of my favourite exactly. yeah. statements. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think this one's for you yeah, to so if we're talk thinking about. about all of this and um, if we're thinking even about the fellow with his 200 um, applications, what he decided to do was um, think about things differently. And perhaps as part of that, um, you can see that he was trying to think creatively and look for an opportunity to do things a bit differently but also um, it's really important to think about you and your point of difference. And that, that requires a certain level of self-awareness and curiosity about yourself. And um, I think a lot of people this year have had the opportunity to have be, become a bit more self-aware and get to know themselves a bit more. And I'd start by saying, believe in your abilities. You've got through the challenging um, task of getting through your law degree and you are now poised at a position to go and do something really interesting with it. I'm challenging you to think about your point of difference, in fact, as being like your superpower. So, for example, one of the comments was, um, oh, I'm getting knocked back because it must be my age coming later to law. I think, in fact, that coming later to law is, in fact, your superpower. So you need to start thinking about it in that way. What incredible life experiences have you had leading up to this that you could explain to um, the law firm or whoever it is you're applying to the job for and um, put in your CV, put in your um, cover letter and this idea of playing to your strengths. So... Um, you may want to set up something which I call a transferable skills list. So it's, um, it's things like, um, I'm really good at talking to people or I'm really good at writing or I'm really good at problem solving or um, I've had a lot of experience managing people or um, uh, I'm always on time. Well, that's your time management. Um, I'm very good at planning things. So it's thinking about who you are, what your strengths are, and then working that into how you can present that um, to the people that you want to be employed by. My, my proviso to that is I think it's always helpful if these things align with your values and your purpose. So take some time to think about what your values and your purpose might be. Um, also, again, being flexible in relation to that. So don't have um, a really rigid view about, you know, I have to have a job that totally aligns with my, my values and my purpose because every job that you do will give you experience and, um, and strength in relation to the next thing that you're going to do. So one of the things that I would suggest is that if you want to do something like this skills list, get a trusted friend or a family member or somebody like that and sit them down and go through that process where they're saying, actually, you're really good at planning things. Actually, you're really loyal, you know, whatever it is. And get them to, to think, think about that and write that down as part of your, your point of difference. I really do believe that it is, in fact, your selling point. A number of students often say to me, oh, I, I, I work in admin or, uh, you know, as a paralegal in a law firm, but I don't have um, other legal experience. 
that's in fact a superpower because you understand how a law firm works. You understand perhaps how the accounting system works or the billing system or you know how the courts work or something like that. So it's about framing things to see them in that positive and um, uh, um, what's the word I'm looking for and flexible way. Um, there's another way you can do it, which is called pathways thinking. And so that's that you could do it on your own or with a friend. That's this idea of just identifying all the different routes you could take to accomplish your goal. Uh, they don't have to be um, realistic, although they can be. And it just helps you feel more creative, a bit more in control, a bit more productive. And while you're doing that, listen out again for negative comments in your head. Listen out for that negativity bias. Oh, I couldn't do that because. And cancel those and fill them with something more positive. So it might be helpful to do that on your own initially and then do it with a, with a trusted friend. Um, and um, I found that has been a really fantastic process for lots of people. You, you, you just go through all these different possibilities to end up in the space that you want to end up in at the end. Opens up all sorts of creative possibilities. Fantastic. This is music to my ears, Andrea. It's wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> I get so, I love it. Um, in terms of like um, building on from what you just spoke about, Andrea, we're, we're coming to this whole concept of your story. Um, or, or also known as what your narrative is. So when you're kind of introducing yourself, whether it be um, at, at an interview or if it's at an, a networking type event, it's always really, really important that you think of what, yeah, what is your point of difference and what is your story? And just when you were talking about that, like what are your transferable skills, particularly as someone coming to the legal profession a little bit later in law, later in life rather, I remember one of my favourite stories was a student that um, came to see me and she was studying law, she was doing her PLT and she said to me, oh, you know, really I've got nothing to show, um, I really just don't know how I'm ever going to get work. So I, I said, so tell me a little bit about your background and what you've done. And it turned out that she'd started her career as a secondary school teacher and then she'd moved across and she'd been in the Royal Australian um, Air Force for about, I don't know, 15 years. And so I kind of just started to ask her more questions because I was so, so fascinated and curious. And the interesting thing was that she actually like had managed teams of up to 40 people and she had coordinated these huge missions over in Afghanistan where she was involved in supporting the operations. She was also involved in a search and rescue aircraft um, in Darwin doing border protection. And I just kind of said to her, so what do you think are some of your transferable skills? And, and I don't think she'd really kind of quite joined the dots. So then we kind of came up with all the ones around complex problem solving, having to make decisions on the spot mm. under incredible stress, leadership, conflict resolution. And so, you know, it was just a matter of reframing her whole story. Yeah. And I believe that, you know, she did go and pick up a role, which was actually quite um, fortuitous. It was through someone at her child's um, kindergarten. She got talking to someone that had their own law firm. She picked up her PLT placement and she's well and truly on her way. But it's really just trying to kind of think about any of these dot points as, yeah, is there yeah. something that I can talk to here yes. that actually sets me apart? Because I always get asked, well, what is my point of difference? Isn't everyone, can't everyone say the same thing? But Well, I yeah. think you raise a really good point. And you don't have to have been in the Army or the Air Force. So I was talking with one of the partners from one of the big firms on the weekend and he was doing interviews for summer clerkships and he said, I look at their extracurricular activities. Mm. So you may not have even had a job. So that's okay. He was looking at people and saying, well, you know, they did rowing for five years. That says to me, 
capacity to get up early, commitment, doing that for five years, and teamwork. Because if you're in a boat of four people, you have to be rowing together. So you don't have to have done an amazing job. You just might have had an interesting and curious hobby that might be something that you can use to leverage from. Absolutely. Yes. So Sorry. I think that's really, really important. Um, we're going to now talk about um, happenstance, which is uh, one of my favourite um, theories, which comes out of career development. And happenstance, planned happenstance, is around creating unexpected opportunities. So it's very much around this concept that we make our own luck. And the way we do this is by putting ourselves out there, by taking risks and by finding environments where we're likely to hear about opportunities. So it's very much around taking advantage of five attributes or five traits. So there's the whole thing about being curious and asking lots of questions and, and getting answers and going and speaking to people. It's also about persistence, and we've talked a lot about persistence and um, resilience and tenacity. The ability to also be flexible and adaptable, to be positive, to be optimistic as well, and to take risks. So if we can all go out there and get involved as much as possible, and I know during COVID it's much, much harder to do that, but it still can happen. We can still do some of this virtually by getting into a position where we're likely to hear of opportunities and learning, learning um, skills as well. So it might not necessarily just be in your immediate area. It is, it is best to look outside, whether that be volunteering um, and it can be within a legal community centre or, or even if you're having problems getting that type of work because it is competitive any type of volunteering is always going to give you a whole range of my a myriad of skills it might be um, even working interstate when when the borders open or it might be just working in the regional areas um, it might be yeah traveling as well it might be kind of getting involved in a committee so it really is about pushing yourself out of your your comfort low comfort load sorry comfort zone and really yeah trying to see um what might be there i think that's a fantastic point i love um particularly the idea of volunteering mm. and i know that's something i have been encouraging students my students to be involved in um, there are so many ways that you can do that online and so many uh, creative opportunities that organisations have come up with, particularly um, uh, not-for-profits, because they aren't receiving a lot of their um, funding uh, from, you know, other areas. So they're, they're trying to reach out and be creative in their approach. So, um, for example, I had a student that was really interested in the law in relation to um, donor conceived people and was listening to a radio program uh, or a television program in relation to that, wrote down the names of the people that were involved in that. Now, if you're shy, that's okay. You don't have to cold call. You can send an email and you can just approach them and say, you know, I'm a law student. Do you have anything that might, I might be able to help you on? Do you, have, um, do you have skills in relation to statistics or something like that that might be useful for an organisation like that? And they obtained a position in that way, which then may lead them on to a paid position because once you're in the loop and you're getting the, the emails from all the other people in the organisation in the paid positions, you suddenly find, oh, actually, they need an admin person. Oh, they need a person that does um, grants for um, applications for grants, whatever it is. Um, and so I would really second this idea of volunteering and it is possible to volunteer online. Even if you type in the words volunteering online at the moment, you can come up with some really interesting solutions. So whatever your, your area of interest, whatever your hobbies are, 
you could probably find that they would be happy to have somebody on board with your skills. That's great. Fantastic. Yeah. So in terms of kind of the next steps that you can start taking from now, um, we've covered a lot of them, but I just wanted to mention the bottom one, which I think um, is also like kind of really, really important. And it is always just trying to be aware and making sure that you are supported by people around you that, that nurture and lift you. Um, so it's kind of just being aware of who the, the pin, pin prickers are and maybe the people that will focus on all the terrible things that are happening at the moment. So they'll be very, very negative and they'll be talking about, you know, everything's just bad. There's just no jobs around and that there's just nothing happening. So I always say if you can surround yourself with marigolds rather than the walnut trees that is going to set you up. So really, really important that you find your marigolds um, and that you um, are aware of the types of conversations that you're having with people and the, the types of, yeah, types of things that will keep on coming up. You'll be able to get a pretty quick idea of whether that person has a kind of a growth or a fixed mindset as well really really important and I really second that um, I would I am always telling my students about at the moment create um, curating their social media so that mm. you don't want to be looking at a whole lot of negative stuff at the moment you want to in a sense draw a sort of circle around yourself and fill that circle with the people that bring you up that strengthen you that make you feel better um, that have positive information that can bring out those um, transferable skills, can see your good points. Those are the people that you want to be surrounding yourself with. And on that previous slide, I've also mentioned this idea of mentors. And those are also the sorts of mentors that you want. They may not even be in law, but they're somebody generally that you like and you like their values, you like what they're doing in their, 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 their work, and they're going to have a wealth of experience that they can share with you. Now, it's okay to approach people um, and get a knockback. That's fine. They're not the right mentor for you at this point in time because they may be busy. But that doesn't mean you can't keep reaching out and looking for other people. But my tip would be to look for someone as a mentor that you actually like and that you actually think that what they're doing is good. So that would be my tip on, on mentors and curate your social media. Every one of my students knows that I go on about this all the time. Yep. Follow good news Absolutely. stories. Mm. Yeah. So to sum up, we wanted you to think about considering how far you've come what you've done already in life is extraordinary. Getting through to October this year is extraordinary. <laughs> and this idea that you need to, at this point, take some sort of action. You need to assume responsibility for your own life, where, you know, and, and be a bit courageous and courageous and creative about it. Um, have the courage to, to take some calculated risks and also to take responsibility for yourself and realise that you may have to endure some discomfort, you know, in order to get to the, the bigger goal. So if you are shy, for example, you know, you may have to be reaching out for mentors and feedback and things like that. Some people find that very difficult, but you can do it in a gentle way. You can do it as an email. You don't have to cold call people. Um, so thinking about... Um, yeah, those creative ways that you can be a bit courageous at the moment. Also really want you to focus on maintaining and strengthening your important relationships. In a sense, that's your circle. That's the people that you let in at the moment that are going to bring you up and make you feel good. And they're also often the things that are going right in your life. So think about those. Um, think about the fact um, that, you know, you may have just done PLT in lockdown if you're in Victoria 
And, uh, you know, that's a really productive thing to have done when uh, we've all been um, locked in. It might be that your health is much better. It might be that you're getting more sleep. It might be that you've discovered you can work from home. There are lots and lots of positive things. I have done a lot of work with students on talking about what's the positive that's come out of COVID for you. So thinking about what's going right in your life right now, make a list of it. And then um, this idea of setting up a resilience bank account. So ticking off each day or each week, if you like, these sort of basic needs. So sleep, is very important and I know with a lot of the students they have been going to bed later and getting up later and you know when life returns to a more normal state that's going to all have to be pushed back so thinking about how much sleep you're getting thinking about what you're also feeding your body thinking about the nutrition that goes into your body um, exercise we all know is fantastic for your mental health it doesn't have to be extreme. It can be a yoga class. It can be a walk around the block. It can be more if that is the thing that is good for you. Um, I'm a big fan of meditation. You know, you can set a little alarm. You can get an app. You, there are so many ways that you can do meditation now. You can do it for 30 seconds and that's enough just to break uh, maybe that negative thought cycle where you're thinking about, you know, uh, I don't ever hear back from companies. Do a little meditation, reset your mind in a more positive way. I'd also want you to really think about being self-compassionate. It's been a really tough year. It's been really hard for so many people in so many different ways. And we are allowed to show ourselves some self-compassion. It's been hard for lots of people in relation to the workforce. So you are allowed to show yourself some self-compassion in that regard. Uh, I really, really strongly want you to think about that point. Um, I'm also a big fan of gratitude. So if you're thinking about the psychology of gratitude, the more you think about the things that you're grateful for, the more you create these pathways in your brain that then spot more things that you're grateful for and it becomes this sort of self-fulfilling prophecy. So I, for example, have a gratitude journal. You don't have to go that far, but I love doing my gratitude journal, thinking about all the things in my day that I'm really grateful for. It's just another way of retraining your brain to be more hopeful and positive also like you to consider which person are you at the moment are you the person that needs to consider saying no are you taking on too much or are you the person that needs to consider saying yes more often yep I'll try that yes I'll volunteer here yes I'll send that email so just have a little think about that think about what your resilience bank account might look at look like um, again maybe that's something you do with a friend um, you can swap ideas, you can think you know, about what it is that you like, what are your hobbies, what are the things that make you feel good, make a list of those. So I really want you to, to take this last page, take a screenshot of it and really think about it. There's some really important points in that, in particular the self-compassion and in particular the gratitude. Mm. Um, so um, we're really happy, aren't we, Susan, to ask any questions? Yeah, totally. Questions. So and it, to think yeah. back on those common themes that we looked about in the beginning, we had this. Um, some of the things were, um, I don't have good enough experience. You know, as simple as adding the word yet. Don't have good enough experience yet. That can help you in what you want to do next. I must be doing something wrong. Okay, so going to that slide, thinking about what can I create? How can I do that pathways thinking? Um, I keep on getting rejected, okay? Um, Susan gave a lovely example of a fellow that took some active steps, so that idea of being active in the process and eventually got a job after a lot of knockbacks. Um, we talked about, I don't even hear back. Okay, that 
idea of gently asking for a bit of professional development feedback. Um, there are, so these are really simple strategies that we've told you in this presentation that you can use to help you with that. My grades are average, but my transferable skills are amazing. Mm. It's thinking of it in that way. Mm. This idea I must be coming um, late to law. Well, what is the amazing experience that you have uh, prior to this? And Susan gave a fantastic example. And not everybody's going to have been to Afghanistan, <laughs> but you may have you may have done rowing or you may have volunteered somewhere. Very very special. It's about thinking about that. So yeah, happy to answer any questions. All right, we might just um, stop the share now. And if anyone has any questions, please just write them into the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. Oh, we've got one. Great. All right. So I'll just, um, I'll read this one. So it may be a little bit off topic, but coming to law a little later in life has definitely assisted. However, yeah. I'm used to a certain level of competence in my job. How would you suggest to combat the frustration that comes with not doing the job as well as you are used to? Great question. Yeah, it's a really good question. Mm -hmm. I think that's, again, it's thinking about this, your transferable skills and thinking about how you're using them in your legal job or your legal um, study or work. And then on top of that, realising that you are new, you are new to this, and you are getting experience and that each day you turn up and go into work, you're getting more experience. And um, I'm not experienced yet, but I will be. I'm not as competent as I would like to be yet, but I will be. And then on top of that, I would be finding a mentor that you like and I would be being really curious about all the resources that the place has to help you um, learn more. So you're showing yourself to be proactive and wanting to be like a sponge and learn more. I think that's a fantastic um, bonus. Any firm would want to know that you want to improve and learn as fast as you can. Uh, and I'd be thinking about those sorts of things, accessing all the um, opportunities that are available to you. And if you're studying, if, it's, if you're at the College of Law, that is what I would be doing with your lecturers. I, I say that to my students at the College of Law. Use me as your buffer. T make all your mistakes now. Just try everything now because it doesn't matter, essentially. You're not going to send a client to jail or waste their money or whatever. You're just putting in answers to questions. So use those resources if that's what you're doing at the moment. Okay, we've got another question um, about if you don't have a clear long-term career goal you are working towards, do you have any practical advice about undertaking research and better understanding what you would want to work towards? So, yeah. yeah. I think that comes down to this idea of knowing yourself and spending a bit of time to think about what your values are and what you like. So you might write down, uh, you know, that you like sport or that you like the arts or that you like, um, uh, you know, whatever it is. And then um, thinking creatively about how uh, you might work on all those things that you like to end up with a goal where you're using those um, those things that you that that interest you in a legal capacity. Does that make sense? Yep, yep, yep. No, it does. So, uh, so I mean, I think kind of what you're saying is just to try and get exposure to a number of different experiences as well along the way. And yeah, but also, what do you like? What do yeah. you like? What do you like doing? And mm. what are your value values? So there's lots of online tests that you can do that can you can type them in. There's one that's called the um, BIA. They have a values quiz and it can just give you what your values are. So it might be really important. Justice might be really, mm. really important to you um, or something like that. So, you know, thinking about who am I? What do I like? What are my interests? What are my values? 
and then using that as a springboard to try some creative things in relation to those values and interests. I mean, I, yeah, I mean, I also think that sometimes you don't really know what you don't like until you try it too. Sorry. And I often yeah. find, like, I often um, had conversations with students, law students that would say, look, I'm only interested in um, working in the community space. I've got no interest in commercial law. Yeah. And then they get the exposure to that, like maybe working in a general practice, and then they actually end up doing a complete flip. So I think that um, whilst it, it's good to have a goal, and I, I totally agree about being values led, I just think sometimes it's also about that flexibility as well and just being open and really just kind of looking at everything as a, a bit of a, a learning a learning opportunity. So I yeah. think that's great. Yeah. I, I'm also really nosy and curious. Mm. So I love knowing what all the different students are doing. And that might be something that's helpful for you if you're doing, if you are at the College of Law, if you're doing group work asking what everybody mm. else is doing, asking um, who likes their work, um, you know, what is their work, uh, is, it, is it family friendly, you know, all sorts of questions mm. around those sorts of things. And you'll find that there are people that say, yeah, I really love X, this is what I'm doing. And then you can assess that and think, hmm, is that something that interests me? I could be friends with them, I could follow what they're doing, I could, um, you know, apply to their place for a, a position, et cetera, et cetera. I think those sorts of things, just that idea of just mm. being curious, standing somebody else's shoes and thinking, mm, is, that, is that something I would want to do? And if you go, mm -mm -mm, you know, as Susan said, you might still want to try it. Uh, absolutely. Um, yeah. We've got a few more questions, so we'll yeah. just go, keep going with those. So someone's asked about um, other avenues for getting feedback if you aren't able to get feedback through the job application process. So with clerkship applications, for example. Um, so that's a really good question, isn't it? If you can't actually get the feedback, um, I mean, there will be other opportunities, I imagine, as you go through your um, process of applying for positions, but I'd even be thinking of um, people that know you well. Yes. And, and you know, people that you've worked with, colleagues, family members, ex-managers, like ask them, what do you think my brand is or what do I represent to you or what are some of the things that perhaps, you know, I could work on and, and, and develop. Um, so I think just kind of really looking at other avenues of, of feedback too um, and trying to kind of keep on, um, even if you know that maybe there are some areas that you're not as strong as, so say you're not comfortable public speaking, maybe forcing yourself um, in, an, in a situation where you can take a bit of a lead role or where you, you put your hand up to, to run a session or, or you always kind of making sure that you've got something to contribute. So I kind of think that, you know, there are other avenues. Um, yeah, I mean, get, 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 other people to, to read, get other people to read your CV, mm. get their feedback on it, not mm. necessarily the employers. But, you know, if you've got a friend that works in um, HR in another capacity or, um, you know, is an English teacher or something like that, just get other people's perspectives on it. Yeah. Um, even, um, you know, fellow students, things like that. Um, and Susan, the lovely Susan, is always there <laughs> to help you with those things. An interview practice is a really important yeah. one too. I mean, I do yeah. offer that, but that's for um, people doing PLT. Um, in terms of how do you know when to say no to opportunities? Do you want to answer that one, Andrea? Yeah, okay. Um, I, I think you'd be going a little bit um, on your gut instinct, I suppose. Um, I was thinking more about saying no if you're feeling overwhelmed, mm -hmm. you've got too much on your plate, uh, you just feel stretched, you don't feel like you've got capacity to, to do any more. Um, well, maybe something on that list you need to say no to. One of the things in your daily um, routine you need to say no to in order to allow the space to open up for that new opportunity. But don't mm. say no to that new opportunity just because it makes you feel a bit scared because um, that might be a good thing still. So don't, um, don't be frightened to take that new opportunity 
but maybe have a look through your list of priorities and work out well, what's something else I could just let go for a little while in order to be able to um, look at this other opportunity. Does that make sense? Okay. Yep. No, that does. That's good. Um, we've got a, gosh, we've got quite a few coming in now um, and it's 1.30. So we'll okay. maybe, yeah, we'll keep going for a little while. In terms of combating career amnesia, I'm sure I've done lots of things of value mm. to put in my resume cover letter interview, but as soon as I'm sitting in front of an application, my mind goes blank. Um, I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm happy to discuss, answer that one. Do you want to have a go, Andrea? Or? Um, I guess yeah. that's where you might get a friend in and say, mm. um, this is, you know, let, let's do it together um, if you're able to do that. Uh, also, have a written list of your transferable skills written out. So that you can kind of mm. look at the question and go, okay, actually I could put in about this. Uh, I could put in, oh yeah, I did that. And, and look at the, um, the job description and yeah. see if you've got things that you can cut and paste that work for that. So if they're looking for somebody that's, um, you know, good at research, think about that summer job where you did some reach research for a law professor or something, or even where you did some research for something completely different and um, yeah have a list have a mm. list so that you can get over that amnesia absolutely absolutely yeah so it's kind of doing a little bit of a reality check as well and seeing what types of common competencies and skills are coming up and yeah. then actually even preparing evidence to support those skills and and really training yourself so that you're able to um yeah pull out kind of the relevant examples from your your toolkit there's another question here about um, studying a JD and working full time and concerns yes. about my bandwidth width to be able to do volunteer work. Any suggestions about how to address that as I progress through my study? Mm. That's, that's a lot, a lot to juggle. I mean, yeah, I mean, I would probably just say, um, even if you can just set yourself some goals just to, even plan ahead um, if you can just even do one thing per semester because there's a lot of people that are in the same boat and it is so incredibly um, stressful and difficult and, and, you know, particularly with the benchmark is getting higher and higher. I think it's just about being practical what you can do and maybe if you can't do it this year, you build it into next year. Um, but it is something... Um, that is very useful to do volunteering for those yeah. reasons. Yeah. I do some volunteering and what I say to them is, um, okay, what's the timeline? And I'm very mm. clear when I started doing the volunteering for them that you're going to have to give me time because I might not be able mm. to give you an answer straight away. So now um, they rang me a week ago and they said, I said, uh, straight out, what's the time frame on this? You've got a month. Oh, okay, that's fine. Um, but I think Susan's right too. Mm. It might even just be getting a database of where, where you might volunteer further down the track, letting mm. them know, um, I want to come and do some stuff for you. Uh, have you got a little project I could help you with now? But I will be available at such and such a time, maybe it's in a year's time, to do something more substantial. So could you keep my details on file? But in the meantime, if there's a small task I could help you with, please send it to me with a timeline. And then maybe you can just go from there. Often mm. it might be they just want some a small bit of legal research, a small bit of legal assistance, um, you know, reviewing something. So those things I find are really achievable. And if it's a bigger task, like the one that they asked me to do, I say, well, what is the time frame? Mm. And it's a month. Okay, well, mm. I can chip away at that. Yeah. At the moment. Yeah. yeah. So okay. We've, yeah. we've got another question, um, which is about someone that has studied um, overseas and they're mm -hmm. a foreign lawyer. Yep. Um, and they've, uh, they're, seeking to be admitted to as a legal practitioner in Australia and they're just talking about what types of things should they use as their point of difference in job hunting because they're, they're finding that they're not getting um, 
they're not kind of getting to that that next stage. So, okay, yeah, um, I think that um, that that working overseas is your point of difference. Mm. I would also be stressing that you have current knowledge of the Australian system, so that there that would be up front, but that you have um, a, a vast uh, knowledge and experience in working in a legal field mm -hmm. and um, looking again at this idea of these transferable skills so you've got research skills you've got time management skills you've got billing skills you've got communicating with clients you've got how things work in a law firm um, you know and and cross-referencing that with any job applications that you were looking for but I actually think that's a big selling mm. point you're not coming in as a brand new um, grad you've actually got lots of experience yeah I agree I mean I think it's kind of also like around the the global mindset and outlook as well and and any language skills like I think yeah. that definitely they're um, really really big pluses so perhaps it's around yeah reframing that story and um, and and talking to other people that have been in the same situation and and really kind of reaching out and having conversations with people just to see what they did and how they went about it. But yeah, I think that it requires a lot of tenacity and resilience. Um, yeah, it's a yeah, difficult. And, and I think that, um, you know, you, you'd want to work for a firm that had that kind or that an organisation that had that kind of belief that your previous experience mm. was valuable. So um, I think that's important as well. Um, and, uh, you know, you might be able to promote some particular areas from the country where you worked so that, um, you know, that there might be um, cross-referencing of clients that might come from that country. I don't, you know, it's hard to know without knowing the specifics. Mm. Um, I know when I did that, they Australian lawyers had a fantastic reputation. They were just super keen to have an Australian lawyer on board, even though I didn't have any of the relevant um, practical experience. But I, you know, I went and did it. I did the the English um, uh, accreditation, so I could practice as an English lawyer. So I, I would be looking at all the things that you have done and all the experience that mm. you have got and any possible advantages to that firm by having links with that with the firm that you worked at previously okay um we've got another question from someone that's a new graduate yeah um they're they're 46 years young i would say Love it. <laughs> um with 23 years experience in health nursing paramedic Etc. They're based in Newcastle, so there would be very few graduate positions. Any any tips? Um, again, I think that um, I would be going through that idea of what what sort of work do I want to be doing? Is it in the health field? Because you're going to have mm. a better chance, I think, working in a legally orientated health field with the experience that you've got. But if that's not your interest, I'd again, I'd be going back to this idea of what have I learned? I've learned to act under pressure. I've learned to make decisions uh, mm. on the spot. I've learned to communicate with people. Paramedics are amazing people, um, have amazing people skills. Mm. I can work under pressure. I can work in difficult situations. Um, you know, I've got good people skills. Uh, all those things I would be um, highlighting if it's not a health area that you want to go into, if it is a legal health area, I think they will be snapping you up because you've mm. got the background knowledge and you've got the legal qualifications. So I hope Absolutely. that's Absolutely. And talk about showing resilience and grit there, going yeah. back and doing Absolutely. that study and having the, the courage to do that. I just think that's, that's phenomenal. And um, I know a couple of people that studied that were nurses before they did law and, and I think, you know, they've ended up in, in all sorts of different areas, whether it be like working for a, a personal injury firm um, to kind of going, ending up in, in family law. So I think it's, it is, it's very yeah, much. I was thinking about family law and I'm also mm. thinking that, um, you know, hospitals have um, 
ethics areas of yeah. ethics and, and those sorts of things that, mm. you know, you maybe transition into something like that and then, it, um, yeah, anyway. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I know. Oh, gosh, there's even, there's just, I think there was one last question. Um, let me just have a look and then I think we might um, finish up. Okay. Oh, yes, there's a few more questions. I do, I do health law as a step up, but interests in criminal mm -hmm. and family. Yeah. Okay, is that from the fellow who the student no, that was I, the paramedic? I don't know. If it um, is, it um, is. No, yeah, it think, is. It is. Yes, yeah, yeah, I think you're absolutely mm. brilliantly positioned, mm. um, particularly at the moment with the situation with COVID, where there's been such a rise in um, incidents of family violence. So I'd be volunteering. I'd be finding a volunteer position in something to do with that, um, where there will be um, a lot of work at the moment. And I would be thinking about um, all my transferable skills from the work I'd done into the field of criminal and mm. family law. And I'm afraid you find that you have it a lot because, um, you know, there's a lot of it, as you know, in relation to assaults on paramedics and things like that. So, you know, I'd be talking about those sorts of things with employers and trying to... Um, really in this we've talked about this before being really creative about the way you think about these things but i would think if i was a criminal or a family law practitioner that 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 combination is dynamite mm. i would not be selling yourself self short mm. also point out too that so much now we've learned from covid is that you can work from home so you may even get a position if there isn't one in newcastle that's possibly in sydney it might be, you know, an online position or something. So, you know, think creatively like that. There might be an organisation that um, has that sort of need in a maybe domestic violence field or assaults or something like that. Fantastic. Well, I think that brings us to an end. So I I'd want, just want to say thank you so much, Andrea. It's just been fantastic hearing this session and being part of it. I feel so kind of privileged and honoured to be able to do that with you. So thank you. No, thank I, you. I, I'm really, I'm really mm. confident that you, it's, it really is about persistence. It's really about just taking action and keeping going. Mm. Even when you don't feel like it, even when you just don't feel like you can stand doing another letter, you know, grabbing yep. those people in your trusted circle and um, motivate each other, listen, listen to motivating podcasts, mm you know, of people that you hope could be your mentors, whatever it is, just to try and change that mindset into something that you can create. Yeah. Absolutely. And watch and out for the negative bias. bias. Yeah. yeah, the, neg the yeah. negative, the negative Nancys. Yeah, that's right. Watch <laughs> um, out for them. Yeah. Thank you. And um, thanks, everyone, for, yeah, participating. for participating. And, and just keep yeah. going away. You will get there. You will. Yep. 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 You might get a few no's, but there's always, always a yes around the corner. <laughs> okay. And um, just, yeah, feel free. We've got another webinar that I'm running, um, I think, next month in November, which is around putting together your elevator pitch with authenticity. So I'm just working on that and putting a panel together. So that will be our, our next webinar and the last one, actually, for, for the year. So thanks very much and look thanks forward guys. to seeing you all soon. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye.